This is the CBC Radio Network. You are listening to CBC Radio 740 Toronto. Sunday matinee, and the start of the summer season of plays that will take you on an excursion back, well, farther than some of you can manage, back to those halcyon days after the end of World War II, the golden age of radio. My name's Frank Perry, and I'm here to tell you first off, the only thing halcyonic about those days was that we were all pretty young, and sometimes I fear a little bit dense. What there really was in those days was tremendous energy and talent. And what radio gave us and the audience was a focus for listeners and a challenge for actors and writers and musicians. You see, we didn't make a lot of movies in Canada, and there was no television. There was little theater from time to time, the New Play Society in Toronto, for example, and uh, the Summer Theater, the Straw Hat Theater, and later on, the Peterborough Summer Theater. So because radio wasn't very expensive, the people avoided telling us how much Jack Benny and Fred Allen made. And we all got to try our wings in front of audiences larger than we'd ever imagined. Well, more of those recollections another time. The first day trip on our summer excursion is a play originally written by Dorothy L. Sayers. But instead of featuring Lord Peter Whimsey, for this one she delved back into early English history. To 1175, to be exact. It's a story of the man who was the architect of Canterbury Cathedral. It's called The Zeal of Thy House. Ms. Sayers wrote the play to be performed in the chapter house of that church. But to bring it across the Atlantic and to radio, the task involved a collaboration between Andrew Allen, who wrote the adaptation, and S. W. Young, who directed this production. Now, a joint effort by these two giants of the Golden Age, and they really were the giants, on a single project was a rarity. Most of the time, each was totally engrossed in meeting the production demands of the broadcast schedule for a play every single week. And now with Robert Christie starring as William Lassans, The Zeal of Thy House. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and rebukes are fallen upon me. He maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flaming fire. servant, Michael the Archangel. I walk in the world of men invisible, bearing the sword that Christ bequeathed his church to sunder and to save. I am God's servant, Raphael the Archangel, and I walk in the world of men invisible. I receive prayer, spoken or unspoken, word or deed or thought or whatsoever moves the heart offering it up before the throne. I am God's servant, the Archangel Gabriel, the heavenly runner between God and man, moving invisible. God's recorder I, that keep the book and cast up all accounts. Cathiel, chief scrivener to the courts of heaven. Their sound is gone out into all lands, and their words into the ends of the world. What is our business here today in Canterbury? A meeting of the cathedral chapter to choose an architect for the rebuilding of the choir after the great fire of 1174. I was sorry to see the old one go. It was a favorite haunt of mine. Prayer had soaked into the stones and sanctified them. 
I have an entry against one Tom Hogg, neat herd, who neglected to clean his chimney and so had his thatch set on fire. The sparks were blown across the road and lodged under the lead roof of the church. A heavy consequence for a light of fence. Was that your doing, Michael? It was. I bore the flame betwixt my hands and set it among the rafters. Was it done to avenge the murder of the Archbishop Thomas of Becky? I do not know. I am a soldier. I take my orders. Your interference in the matter does not affect the debit against Tom Hawk. He stands charged with sloth to a considerable amount. What use was made of his sin is neither here nor there. Invisible. Let us attend this meeting of the cathedral chapter. There is a decision to be made. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. The year of our Lord, 1175. Recorded herein by myself, Father Gervais, historian and clerk to the chapter of the Cathedral Church of Christ at Canterbury. A meeting for the appointment of an architect. The prior of Christ Church being in the head chair, those attending were Father Stephen, the treasurer, Father Theodotus, the sacristan, Father Martin, the choir master, Father Wolfram, the director of the farm, Father Arnulfus, the director of the kitchen and distillery, Father Paul, the gardener, Father Hilary, the almoner, Father Sylvester, the painter, the choir brothers, and Brother Hubert, the superintendent of the rough masons. Brethren, our earlier discussions have brought the number of suitable candidates down to three. John of Kent, William of Sars, and Henry of York. Have we the estimates, Father Prior? Two of them, Father Treasurer. Henry of York's is lower than John of Kent. John of Kent is a local man. It would look well to give the work to a local man. Uh, John is very young. Young men are always full of extravagant ideas. His estimate is certainly rather high. Perhaps we had better have the architect in. Father Gervais, if we will be so good. Certainly, Father Prior. On behalf of the choir, I think we should get a man who knows something about acoustics. I understand that William of Sars... William of Sars is a foreigner. Money should be kept in the country. We uh, do not seem to have an estimate from William of Sars. Not yet. He writes to me here... The architect's father, Prior. Ah, good morning, sirs. Pray, come to the table. Master Henry of York, you have submitted a very conservative estimate. My Lord Prior, with the exception of the more grievously damaged portions, I see no reason why the existing outer walls may not be retained. You think they are not too much weakened by the action of the fire? Weakened? They are calcined in places almost to powder. They can be patched and grouted, Master John. And by the addition of supporting buttresses and by altering... Will not the effect of the buttresses be somewhat clumsy? I should think it would be bad for sound. My plan will be cheaper and quicker. I could engage to be ready within two years. And in two years more, you will have to rebuild again. My Lord Prior. You, Master John of Kent, recommend a complete reconstruction? This botching is useless and dangerous. It is unfair. Master John, I am older than you and more experienced. You never in your life built anything bigger than a parish church. Master John, Master John. This is the Cathedral Church of Can Christ at Canterbury. Will you insult God with patchwork? Give me the commission, Lord Prior, and I will build you a church worth looking at. Will somebody please tell me where the money is to come from? Canterbury is the most important church in the kingdom and attracts a great many people to the town. What with the visitors and the great increase in the number of pilgrims since the lamented death of the late Archbishop, Thomas, pray for us. a little money spent now on building will repay itself handsomely in donations and bequests. If the fire was a divine judgment for the Archbishop's murder, then the new building should be an offering worthy of its high destination and a sufficient sacrifice for the sins of this country. No artist can do his best work when he has to consider every halfpenny. I observe Father Anulfus is asleep again. As usual, all this talk about money is sheer lack of faith. 
God will provide. No doubt, Father Theodotus. But humanly speaking, the accounts will have to go through the treasury, and I feel responsible. How long will your plan take, Master John? Seven years. Seven, Seven years? years? Perhaps yes. more. Why, God made the world in six days. God, Father Martin, was not subject to limitations of funds and material. Nor to the cheese-paring parsimony of a monastic chapter. Possibly God is an abler architect than any of us. Master William of Sars, you have stood very quiet. We have not heard your opinion. Do you think it possible to restore the remaining fabric? Oh, I should think very likely. I should certainly hope to save some of it. That is not what you said outside. But I really cannot say. I do not see how anybody can say without prolonged and careful examination. That's very true. Very reasonable. That is why I have as yet prepared no estimate or plan. But I have brought some drawings of the work entrusted to me at Sons and elsewhere, which will give you some idea of the kind of thing I should like to do here. And not too ornate. It is like a poem in stone. I should dearly love to see it. Naturally, I should commit you to nothing without the advice and approval of yourself, Lord Pryor, and the Father Treasurer. Well, just so. We should object to nothing in reason. I should be obliged to stipulate for the best materials. God's service demands the best materials. But we can effect an economy by making good use of local talent. I'm all in favor of local talent. And a further economy by the use of certain mechanical devices of my own invention. Thank you. Well, brethren, I think we have now the facts before us. If these gentlemen would kindly retire for a few moments... Two or three years only, Lord Pryor, say four at the most, and a strict regard to the economy. Consider, Lord Pryor. A structure worthy of its dedication well, and safety to life and limb, if you think that matters. Sir, if I am chosen, I will do my best. The motives of mankind are lamentably mixed. They mean well, I assure you. Then it is a pity they do not say what they mean. I have worn out my pen trying to keep up with them. What will they make of it all? They will choose the man whom God has appointed. And I, Gabriel, shall see to it that they do. Father Gervais, how does the voting stand? The voting is even, Father Pryor. Equal votes for John of Kent and William of Sars. Somebody has not voted. Who is it? It is Father Adolphus. He is asleep. He has been asleep all the time. He's getting very shaky, poor old soul. Wake him up and record his vote. This is where I interfere. Father Arnolfus? <laughs> what? Do you vote for John of Kent or William of Sons? <laughs> William of Sons. <laughs> yes, of course. William of Sons. He hasn't heard a word. Father Adolphus! Shout! Hey, I'm not deaf. I followed everything very carefully. I said William of Sons, and I mean William of Sons. Really, Father Pryor? You'll never move him now. The vote of the chapter, then, is for William of Sons. <laughs> nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. Every carpenter and workmaster that laboreth night and day, the smith also sitting by the anvil, and the potter turning the wheel, all these trust to their hands, and every one is wise in his work. They will maintain the state of the world, and all their desire is in the work of their craft. Two years of toil are past. What shall I write about this architect? A schedule here, long as my sword crammed full of deadly sins, juggling with truth and gross lust of the body, drink, grabbing, swearing. Slothfulness in prayer, the devouring, insolent ambition that challenges disaster. 
These are debts. What shall I set upon the credit side? Six columns and their aisles with covering vaults from wall to arcading, and from thence again to the center with the keystones locking them, all well and truly laid without a fault. No sum of prayer to balance the account. Ask Raphael, for prayers are in his charge. Come, Raphael, speak. Not with the lips alone, but with the hand and with the cunning brain men worship the eternal architect. So when the mouth is done, the work shall speak and save the work. True as masons rule and vine can make them, the shafted columns rise singing like music. And by day and night, the unsleeping arches with perpetual voice proclaim in heaven, to labor is to pray. Glory to God that made the firmament. Here are the letters for you to sign, Master William. Ah, uh -huh, the pen and ink horn. Ah. These to Khan about the next shipment of stone. These to Dover with instructions for the unloading and carriage. Thanks, Father Trevor. Master William. What can I do for you, Father Treasurer? We have a visitor. Father, an important visitor. Ah, oh, and Father Martin, and who is your important visitor? The Lady Ursula de Warby. We had been hoping she would come. The Lady Ursula is the widow of an exceedingly wealthy knight. She has come to reside in Canterbury and wants to see over the new choir. If she's pleased with what she sees, she will probably be good for a handsome subscription. Oh, very well. Take her where you like. Uh, yes, but the point is, she particularly wants to meet the architect and be shown around personally. Master William, I'm sure you will oblige her. People always like to talk to the architect. The human touch, you know. It's always good publicity. I've no use for women. Not in working hours. Please, Master William. She's with her father prior now, expecting you. Oh, all right. I'll be a martyr to publicity. <laughs> There's no one work today. Simon, Walter. I am sorry to have had to raise my voice to the workmen, madam. At the moment my back is turned, everything seems to come to a standstill. No wonder, Master William. Without the heart, how can the limbs do their office? You are the heart of the undertaking. It is very good of you to say so, Lady Ursula. That is the bell for nones. Do you propose to attend nones, madam? The lower part of the nave is available for the laity. No. I propose to see those drawings of yours. I do not think you came here to see architectural drawings, Lady Ursula. I came to see the architect. Did you realize that this was not the first time we had met? I realized it perfectly. I had the honor to pick up your glove yesterday in the marketplace. I was much indebted to you for the courtesy. I was much indebted to you for the opportunity. I am an opportunist. So, I fancy, are you. Is that an impertinence, I wonder? Yes. I ought to be offended with you. If you are wise, you will be. Let us be plain. The first time our eyes met, we knew one another as fire knows tinder. You have seen what havoc fire works. Let me. I do not fear the fire. I do not learn that it is perilous to play with fire. That it is death to come between the man and the work. In one man's life is room for one love and no more. One love. I am in love with a dream. Tell me your dream. What use have women for the dreams of a man, save to destroy them? What does a woman know of the love of knowledge, passing the love of women? The passion of making, beside which love's little passion shows, brittle as a bubble, to raise up beauty from ashes, like the splendor of resurrection, to see the stone knit unto stone and growing, as in the womb, bone grows to bone. Build a world out of nothing. That is my dream. That is the craftsman's dream. Power and glory, the kingdom of God and man. Of man, never of woman. Women create passively, born on a wind of lust, for a whim at the caprice of a man in a smile, in a spasm of the flesh. <laughs> 
We, with the will, with the blood, with the brain, all desire of the soul, the intent of the mind. How do you understand what my dreams are? And why they are not for you? I understand. Knowledge and work. Knowledge is given to man and not to woman. And the glory of the work to man and not to woman. But by whom came either work or knowledge into the world? Not by the man. God said, ye shall not know. Knowledge is death. And Adam was a prey. But Eve, careless of peril, careless of death, hearing the promise, ye shall be as God, sees knowledge for herself. And for the man and all the sons of men. Knowledge like God. Power to create like God. And unlike God, courage to die. And the reward for her was sorrow. But for Adam, the reward was work. Of which he now contrives to boast as his peculiar glory. And in one breath, denies it to the woman and blames her for it, winning the toss both ways. <laughs> My simple Adam, it is too late to scare woman with risks and perils. Woman that for one splendid risk changed the security of paradise, broke up the loom and pattern of creation, let in man's dream on the world, and snatched the torch of knowledge from the jealous hand of God so that the fire runs in man's blood forever. So that she runs like fire in a man's blood forever. Take what thou wilt, the risk, the sorrow, the fire, the dream. And in the dream's end, death. So quickly now. I will come to your lodging after supper. Bringing your dreams with you. Thus, Eve, cast down the gauntlet in God's face. My will for thine, man's purpose against God's. Slay me and slay the man, slay all my seed. But let man's knowledge and man's work go on. Thus God took up the gauntlet in Eve's face, having like man courage to look on death. My son for thy sons, and God's blood for man's. Crucify God, but let the work go on. By man came sin. O Felix Culpa, quae talis et cantae meruit redemptoris. <laughs> Two more years followed upon those which were gone, so that four years had passed in which the work continued. In the season of Lent of the year of our Lord, 1179, the Triforium and the Clerestory being finished, the day came in which was to be placed in position the keystone of the great arch. He's a good worker, is Master William. <laughs> when he works, he works. All right. <laughs> and when he plays, he plays. Him and the lady earth. That's another lot, my lad. The animals went in two by two. Hey, ho, nolly. Said the dog, bow wow. Said the cat, mew, mew. Spring is the time for love. That's no concern of ours. That's their affair. Quite right. The day for labor and the night for sleep. <laughs> Two by two, they went into the ark. Hey, ho, nonny. The doors were shut. They were all in the dark. Spring is the time for us. Don't you forget, my <laughs> lad. The Lady Ursula takes a lot of interest in us. Always coming to see how the job's getting on. Or calling on the Father Treasurer with a little donation. But when old Noah opened the door, hey, ho, nonny. They all came out by three and four. Spring is the time for us. For shame, my son. For shame. Yeah. It's the father sacristan. We cannot have these new songs here. Sorry, Father. 
to see, Father Pryor. I see, Father Theodotus. Heads wagged in the marketplace. And tails going round in the alehouse. Fingers pointed everywhere at William of Sons, the cathedral architect. Notorious evil liver, a seducer of women, a taker of bribes. That was not proved, I fancy. A man without truth, without shame. You must not say without truth, lest you should hear the very stones cry out against you. I'd rather have a worse built church with a more virtuous builder. Make God the loser for your conscience's sake. The kingdom of heaven is won by righteousness. Will you not let God manage his own business? He was a carpenter and knows his trade better perhaps than we do. Shall not we make bonfire of this scandal in the church and burn God's honor clean? God is a man and can defend his honor. We need not play nursemaid to the babe of Bethlehem to shield him from the harlot and the thief or keep those tender innocent hands from harm that bear the sharp nails imprint. His laws are broken. Must we stand by and smile and still do nothing? Talk not of William, nor another's fault, unless to God, who hears but spreads no scandal. Of this be sure, who will not have the gospel shall have the law, but in God's time, not ours. <laughs> This is the day, Lord Father Pryor, the day we place the keystone of the great arch. I know Master William. A great day. I am having a traveling cradle rigged, and I'm going up to do the job myself. My son, the talk of the town comes to our ears sometimes. It seems that even a master architect may find interests outside his work. Outside his working hours, Father Pryor. I quite appreciate that. My dear son, as your father in God, I might find many things to say to you. But as a man of the world, you doubt whether I should listen. As a man of the world, I might urge the value of discretion. Father Theodotus would say of hypocrisy. Father Theodotus is not your employer. The church is your employer. And it is my duty to speak for the church. Very well. As my employer, what faults have you to find with my private amusement? Miss, that instead of attending to their work, your workmen waste their time in gossip about you. If you choose to be damned, you must. If you prefer to make a deathbed repentance, you may. But if an idle workman does an unsound job now, no repentance of yours will prevent it from bringing down the church some day or other. You are quite right. I congratulate you. You have found the one argument to which I am bound to listen. Were you a diplomat before you were a churchman? Perhaps. <laughs> Simon? Yes, sir. Is that the rope to rig the traveling cradle? Yes, sir. I'm to wind it off this drum and onto this... Is bridge. it a sound rope? Oh, yes, sir. But I'm to test it as I want... See that every inch of it is well tested before I go up? Yes, sir. I'll test it well. Ah, good morning, Father Theodotus. Just the man I was looking for. Pray, will you help Simon to test that rope? Rope? It is to hoist me up to the top of the great arch. Should I have a value for my neck? Oh, by all means. Test it with the eye and the hand. Don't trust to either alone. <laughs> Are there no fires in heaven where every man with his own hand upon the anvil of sin forges a sword of judgment? Gabriel, Raphael, there is a sword in the making. Look you to it. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. He maketh his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain upon the just and unjust. We 
William. Ursula, you've come at a good moment. <laughs> what are they doing? We are about to put the key in the great arch. Presently, you will see me fly to the top of the scaffold in a machine of my own devising. And down again, like Blessed St. Paul in a basket. How amusing. I hope it is safe. Never fear for that. Father Theodosius is scandalized and squeezes his eyes tight shut in prayer. While Simon the workman watches gleefully the antics of the lady and his master. Is this a way to test a rope? It is a way to forge a sword. I, Gabriel, the messenger between God and man, must move invisible to warn the workmen. I, Raphael, who receive prayer, must move invisible to warn the praying priest. Oh, the good fathers will be in a fine to do over this. The Lady Ursula and Master William meet him brazenly right in the church itself. <laughs> Take care, Simon. There is a flaw in the rope. Look at them. Touching hands and smiling. Oh. Keep your eyes on the rope, Simon. The rope that passes through your hands. Spring is the time for love, right enough. Take care, Simon. There is a flaw in the rope. No wonder Father Theodorus keeps his eyes shut. <laughs> the rope, Simon! Sancta Maria, ora pro nobis. Sancta Dea Genetrix, ora pro nobis. Virgo Virginum, Hora Take Pronobis. care, Theodotus. There is a flaw in the rope. Mater Castissima, Hora Pronobis. Mater Inviolata, Hora Pronobis. Mater Intemerata, Hora Pronobis. Theodotus, the rope that passes through your fingers. Virgo Predicana, Hora there Pronobis. There is a flaw in the rope. Virgo Potens, Hora Pronobis. The rope! <laughs> Go and rig the cradle. I'll be with you presently. Ursula. You and I are in disgrace with the prior. Why? Scandal. He will not take the work away from God me. God would not let him. He has put me here and will keep me here, prior or no prior. Do we presume too much upon God's mercy? We are the master craftsmen, God and I. We understand one another. None as I can, can creep under the ribs of God and feel his heart beat through those six days of creation. Enormous days slowly turning lights, streaking the yet unseasoned firmament, giant days, titan days, yet all too short to hold the joy of making. God caught his breath to see the poles of the world stand up through chaos. And when he sent it forth, the great winds blew, carrying the clouds. And then he made the trees for winds to rustle through, oak, poplar, cedar, hawthorn, and elm, each with its separate motion. And with his delicate fingers painted the flowers. Numberless. Numberless. Why make so many but that he loved the work as I love mine. And saw that it was good as I see mine. The supple swift mechanics of the serpent. The beautiful furred beasts and curious fish. Dragons and monsters in strange shapes. To make his angels laugh with him. When he saw those, God sang for joy and formed the birds to sing. And lastly, since all heaven was not enough to share that triumph, he made his masterpiece, man. That like God can call beauty from dust, order from chaos, and create new worlds to praise their maker. Oh, but in making man, God overreached himself and gave away his Godhead. He must now depend on man for what man's brain creative and divine, can give him. Man stands equal with him now, partner and rival. Say God needs a church. And here in Canterbury, and say he calls together by miracle, stone, wood, and metal builds a church of sorts. My church he cannot make, another but not that. This church is mine, and none but I, not even God, can build it. Me hath he made vicegerent of himself, and were I lost, something unique were lost irreparably. My heart, my blood, my brain are in the stone. God's crown of matchless works is not complete without my stone, my jewel. Creation's not parallel. Hush! God will hear you. The priests say he is jealous. Tempt him not lest he should smite and slay. He will not dare. He knows that I am indispensable to his work here. And for the work's sake, he will keep me safe when the last stone is laid. Then may he use me as he will, I care not. 
The work is all. Except the Lord build the house, their labor is but lost that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and rebukes are fallen upon me. For thou art great, and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Michael, the hour is come. There he goes! There he is! Run halfway up in the traveling train. It's wonderful how well Master William's machines work. They've hard the labor of building. Now stay. Our new choir will be ready for us within the year. There's the keystone strung aloft on the crane. See, dear, it's Master William the architect being raised way up there in a rope. To put the big stone in place. Let's go! Get ready to hear, boys! Oh, this be brave! It's so high, I'd be frightened. Master William's up now! Just getting to the top of the scaffolding! Oh, look! Look at the angel! The terrible angel! What's that? What's the voice saying? An angel? What? Where? Nonsense! What do you mean? High on the scaffold with the drawn sword in his hand! <laughs> Of God, the rope was broken. He's falling. Master William is falling. Father, in pity, tell me, is he dead? No, my poor child, but sorely maimed. Oh, God, could you not have broken me and not him? He'll never be the same man again, Hubert. I must know how all this came to pass. My Lord Prior, there was a flaw in the rope. Just as the cradle came up to the level of the scaffolding bearing Master William, I saw the strands break asunder. I stretched out my hands to catch him, but I could not reach. If I could have done anything, anything, I'd gladly have given my life. So would I, Hubert. I am sure you would, Hubert, and you, Father Jervis. What I should like to know is... Who had the testing of that there rope? It was I. It was my neglect. I have no excuse. I shall never forgive myself. It was my fault. I was talking to William, distracting the attention of them all. This is a judgment for our sins. True, it was a judgment. Ask this boy here. Did he not see the angel thrust him down? Yes, child. What is this about an angel? I saw a great angel stand between heaven and earth, all in gold and scarlet, with a drawn sword. Oh, and he had great wings, too. He cut the rope and the cradle fell. You see, it was a divine judgment. Divine judgment? The boy's dreaming. It was rank carelessness. Simon, who was at the other end of that rope when you tested it? Speak up, man. Who was it? It was I. But I had nothing to do with it. You heard what the child said. It was a miracle. Did you at any moment take hand or eye from the rope? while you were testing at Theodotus. I, I cannot remember. She was there with William. For my soul's sake, I could not look at them. I was saying my prayers. Saying your prayers? With a master's safety dependent on you? God himself laid the seal upon my eyes. I was his appointed instrument to overthrow the wicked man. Think what you say, my son. It is not for us to ordain ourselves the ministers of vengeance. For it must needs be that offences come. But woe unto that man by whom the offence cometh. For better he had not been born. This is thy sin. Thou hast betrayed the work. Thou hast betrayed the church. Thou hast betrayed Christ in the person of his fellow man. What was the prayer wherein thou offeredst up thy brother's life? The litany of the virgin. Go to the church, repeat it once again, saying at every line, This was the spear with which I pierced the body of the Lord. Then come to me and ask for absolution. I will obey. 
For you, my son and daughter, you see how sin brings its own suffering. <laughs> Do not despair. God's mercy is very great. <laughs> I have brought some extra coverings for Master William's bed since he has taken this fancy for lying here in the church. He is so restless. Day and night he thinks of nothing but the building and frets because he must lie helpless. It is impossible to move him without causing severe pain. I suppose nothing would induce him to resign the appointment. Part him from his work? Oh no, it would be more bitter to him than death. But frankly, dear brother, a sick man with a crippled spine and during this half year since his accident, things have not gone quite so well. Leave me alone, all of you, Cancho. <sighs> Jervais, find me the measurements for those cobbles. Yes, William. You got them all wrong, as I knew they would. If I had the use of my limbs, I'd give them something to remind them who's in charge here. I have to lie helpless as a log while you make a mess of it among you. Oh, God. Shall I never be able to do anything again? May I come in? Pax Tecum, my son. Pax Tecum. That come spirit or two. And how do you feel this evening? Horrible, Father and was horrible. It's this dreadful hot weather. I don't know when I remember such a trying June. I'm sure we never had such unwholesome heat when I was a boy. But see, Father Paul has sent you a dozen or so of the early strawberries. We thought you might like them for your supper. That's very good of you and Father Paul. Are they the first strawberries? The very first. Nobody else has had any, and not even Father Pryor. I hope you will find them sweet. Though I must say, fruit doesn't seem to have the flavor it had in my young days. Oh, I shall enjoy them immensely. Thank you very much. Now, you mustn't lose heart. I, I am going, or I shall tire you out. Good night, my son. May God watch over and restore you. This is what I have come to, Jarvis. To be nursed and cuddled and comforted like a child with strawberry. Pastor William, there is one without would speak with you. Oh. The Lady Ursula. I will not see her. She asks to be my wife, my nurse, my servant, to devote her life. I will not have people sacrificing themselves for me. It is monstrous. It is impossible. Tell her so. She says she is here for the last time. She is very unhappy. I think you ought I beseech you to let her come. This is a new tune for you to sing, Father Theodosius. I have learned a little charity of late. Let me beg of you. Oh, very well. William, I have come to say goodbye. Since I am nothing to you now, and the world without you is nothing to me, I can but take refuge at the throne of grace and pray for both of us. That is folly, my dear. You in a convent of nuns. Go, be happy. And forget me. That is the one thing I cannot do. I am not a man, Herschel. I am a cripple with a broken back. With a dead past, bury its dead. Our dream is over. William. Had I, at any time, even for a moment, any part in your dream? I hardly know. But once, high in a corner of the clerestory, where none but God will look for it, I carved an angel with your face. Oh, it was heavy even.
even unto death. And something not myself moves in the dusk. Fearfully. Light. Light. Light! Let there be light. Behold, the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. I am Michael, the sword of God. The edge is turned toward thee, not for those sins whereof thou dost repent, but for the sin so much a part of thee, thou knowest it not for sin. What sin is that? Sin is of the heart. Oh, my heart was in my work. Even so. The sin was in my work? That cannot be. I grant the work not perfect. No man's work is perfect. But what hand and brain could do such as God made them, that I did. Doth God demand the impossible? Then blame God, not me, that I am man, not God. He has broken me, has sought to snatch the work out of my hand. Let him destroy me, since he has the power to slay the thing he envies. While I have breath, my work is mine. He shall not take it from me. No, thou shalt lay it down of thine own will. Never. Let him heap on more torments yet. He can heap none on thee. He hath not borne. Let him strike helpless hands as well as feet. Whose feet and hands were helpless, stricken through. Scourge me and smite me and make blind mine eyes. As he was blindfolded and scourged and smitten. Cramp me with pain. As he was cramped with pains, racked limb from limb upon the stubborn cross. Harch me with fever. He that cried, I thirst. Bring out my blood and sweat. Who sweat like blood, watered the garden in Gethsemane. For all that he can do, I will not yield, nor leave to other men that which is mine, to botch, to alter, turn to something else not mine. Thou wilt not, yet God bore this too, the last, the bitterest, worst humiliation, bowing his neck under the galling yoke, prostrate, defeated, half his life unlived, nothing achieved. Could God, be God, do this? Christ, being man, did this cried it is finished and gave up the ghost finished when men had thought it scarce begun then his disciples with blind faces mourned weeping we trusted that he would redeem israel but now we know not what said he behind the shut doors in jerusalem at a mass and in the bitter dawn by galilee i go but feed my sheep for me, the Sabbath of the long week's close. For you, the task. For you, the tongues of fire. Thus shalt thou know the master architect, who planned so well, he may depart and leave the work to others. Art thou more than God? Not God himself was indispensable, for lo, God died, and still his work goes on. Oh. I have sinned, the eldest sin of all. Pride that struck down the morning star from heaven hath struck down me. Yet, just that merciful God, hear me but once. Thou that didst make the world and wilt not let one thing that thou hast made, no, not one sparrow, perish without thy will. Since what we make we love, for that love's sake, smite only me and spare my handiwork. Jesus, you, the carpenter's son, the master builder, architect, poet, maker, let not the church be lost through me. Let me lie deep in hell, but let my work, all that was good in me, all that was God, stand up and live and grow. The work is sound, Lord God, no rottenness there, only in me. Wipe out my name from men, but not my work. To other men the glory, and to thy name alone. But if to the damned be any mercy at all, oh, send thy spirit to blow apart the thundering flames that I, after a thousand years of hell, may catch one glimpse, one only, of the Church of Christ, the perfect work. 
finished. Sheath thy sword, Michael. The fight is won. Close the book, Cassio. The score is paid. Give glory, Raphael. The race is run. Lead homeward, Gabriel. The sheep that strayed. Glory to God in the highest. Holy is he. William? Your master? God hath changed my mind. I must submit. I must go back to France. My place is here no more. I am in God's hand. Take me and bear me hence. Dear master, whither? To the Lady Ursula's lodging. If unto her I can make any amends, then I will make it. To all of you... I owe a debt of love, which I will pay with love. Only to God, that royal creditor, no debt remains. He, from the treasure of his great heart, has paid the whole sum due and canceled out the bond. Laos, Deo. of men, lift up your hearts, Lord, and magnify God, the everlasting wisdom, the holy, undivided, and adorable Trinity. Praise him that he has made man in his own image, a maker and craftsman like himself, a little mirror of his own triune majesty. For every work of creation is threefold, an earthly trinity to match the heavenly. First, there is the creative idea, passionless, timeless, beholding the whole work complete at once, the end in the beginning. And this is the image of the Father. Second, there is the creative energy, begotten of that idea, working in time from the beginning to the end, with sweat and passion being incarnate in the bonds of matter. And this is the image of the Word. Third, there is the creative power, the meaning of the work and its response in the lively soul. And this is the image of the indwelling spirit. And these three are one, each equally in itself, the whole work whereof none can exist without other. And this is the image of the Trinity. Behold then and honor all beautiful work of the craftsman, imagined by men's minds, built by the labor of men's hands, working with power upon the souls of men, image of the everlasting Trinity, God's witness, in world and time. And whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. The Zeal of Thy House by Dorothy L. Sayers. The play was adapted for radio by Andrew Allen and presented with a musical score composed by Lucio Agostini and conducted by Francesco Fusco. 
Starred as William of Sons, Robert Christie, with Sandra Scott as Lady Ursula. Barry Morse was heard as the prior, Bud Knapp as Father Theodotus, Alan King as Father Stephen, Frank Perry as Father Gervais, William Needles as Father Wolfram, Bruce Belfridge as Father Ernulfus, and Colin Eaton as Father Martin. Eric Christmas was Henry of York, and Neil McCallum, John of Kent, the two architects. In the parts of the four angels, Frank Petty as Michael, Howard Milsom as Raphael, Lloyd Bachner as Gabriel, and Larry McCants as Cassiel. As pilgrims and workers, the voices of Jeremy Wilkin, John Madison, Jane Mallett, Don Greenhalsh, Roland Bull, and Elizabeth Cole. John Draney and Jack Scott were the two narrators, versicle and response. The play was produced by Andrew Allen and directed by Essa W. Young, with sound effects by Bill Roach and technical operation by John Sliz. Lamont Tilden speaking. Next week at this time, we'll bring back another great play from those other days. It's a classic family story by Lister Sinclair. The blood is strong. I'm Frank Perry. Oh, you'll, uh, you'll recognize me by the lantern I'll be waving for this summer excursion on Sunday matinee. <laughs>